Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. This is the Saturday edition. This is because when you have a trial start on Friday, then you kind of have to do a Saturday edition to go over the opening statements. So I did cover the opening statements live. Here's a link to the opening statements. If you want to see them in their entirety, I will warn you ahead of time. They do show autopsy photos and crime scene photos without any blurring. Yeah, it was a little shocking. <laughs> I have all I I always maintained I do not need to see autopsy photos, and I was very surprised when they came up in the prosecution's opening statement PowerPoint. Boom! There was the picture. Like no warning whatsoever. The cameraman, if he, even if he had been ordered not to show it, I don't think knew it was going to be up there. So, in any case, it was there. <laughs> so, how are you guys? It's Saturday. I didn't do the Friday dance because I covered the opening statements. Should I do the Friday dance on Saturday? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm ready. I've got my comfortable shirt, my Saturday comfortable shirt, you know. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, <laughs> that's your Friday dance. I know if you're new to the channel, that's it's just the thing I do, and everybody loves it. Okay, Friday dance. So we're gonna talk. This we're talking about the state of Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada, versus Thomas Randolph. And I was really interested because this is the retrial, as you may recall. He has already been convicted by a jury of the murders of his wife Sharon and the murder of his handyman Mike Miller who allegedly was robbing them um yeah he was in the in the middle of a burglary when Sharon happened upon him and he shot her and then you know he had a ski mask on so uh, Thomas came in and shot him but that's not what really happened. No. So in any case, <laughs> in the original trial where he was convicted and sentenced to the death penalty, it came out about one of his ex-wives. He has five former wives. Number one is alive. Number two committed suicide. Number two is the one that was mentioned in the prior trial because she was found dead in her bed with the covers up, you know, her suicide note on the kitchen table covers her up to her here. And she just took the gun and except she would have had to do it this way. Anyway, shot in the head. So he gets tried for that. Yeah. This is not his first rodeo. He gets tried for the murder of his second wife. And it comes out during that trial that he had been grooming an individual to murder his wife but the individual i don't know if he changed his mind he just didn't go through with it which they are alleging is what happened in the current murder trial that he was grooming michael miller to kill his wife and these similarities because it was so similar the prior judge or the the judge on the first trial let that in. So the Supreme Court of Nevada said, no, you can't. No, no, no. Try this murder case. Don't try the other one. He was found not guilty. You can't mention that. Now, I don't know if, it, if he had been found guilty. Maybe you could mention it. So I was really anxious to hear what was the prosecution going to argue in this retrial if they're not allowed to argue about the prior wives because i started to go through them okay one still alive divorced her he had a couple kids with her divorced her. number two suicide had a life insurance policy collected on that i don't know how because i didn't know you could collect if it was suicide but in any case um third wife we don't know much about fourth wife So the third wife, yeah, we don't know much about third wife, but they were only married a short period of time, like 11 months. And then she dies of cancer 10 years later. So nothing to do with him. Fourth wife, they get a divorce after 
she left him because he was cleaning his gun one night and it went off <laughs> and just missed her. And she's like, oh, I'm out of here. And uh, wisely so. And then the fifth wife had a heart condition. She needed a valve replacement surgery. So he encourages her to have the surgery. She has the surgery. She's recovering. The heart surgery was successful. She's eating. She's drinking. She's, you know, second day of recovery. Everything's going peachy. He comes to visit. He asks her daughter, can you step out and give us a few minutes alone? And she's like, oh, sure. Okay. 45 minutes later, he comes out and goes, hey, mom died. Yeah. Then. He turns around and sues the hospital. So he collects her life insurance, sues the hospital. And you're like, does this man do anything for a living? No, he's a retired special education teacher with a bad back. So takes a lot of oxycodone for his back. So I'm curious, okay, what are they going to hang their hat on? What's the evidence if you're just limiting your circumstantial evidence to this case what are you going to argue so here's what they argued they talked about the night of the murder they that he had gone out with his wife they had gone to this santa fe casino they had dinner they frequented that place a lot the plan was to see a movie but that night and it's debatable. It was Mother's Day weekend. It's debatable whether that he had taken her out for Mother's Day or not. But in any case, they have a dinner. She takes home the leftovers. And they decide they're going to go home and get a little frisky instead of watching the movie. They can watch movies at home, right? Of course. <laughs> so so they go home. He's pulling in to the two-car garage. But in order to get in there, you have to, the passenger has to get out first. So they explain all that, and then they show excerpts from the video walkthrough. And I've shown you, I've shown you like ten minutes of the video walkthrough. It, the video walkthrough is actually almost an hour, like forty-eight minutes. So that is going to be shown to the jury later on. But during the openings, it was just the excerpts. Then they mentioned to the jury that there was no evidence to support Thomas Randolph's theory of how this happened. Because he's saying that he fired several shots at Michael Miller that night. That he comes in, he sees his wife laying in the, the bedroom doorway. Uh, that she's injured. He goes to this hall closet to grab a gun and puts it in his pocket. And then when he comes as he's exiting the closet, he's confronted by this burglar with a ski mask on, a.k.a. Mike Miller, his handyman. He, um, <laughs> so he shoots him and he's like, boom, 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 boom. And he's, you know, on the video thing, he's reenacting, boom, 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 with a nine millimeter. <laughs> yeah, not, not a small caliber weapon at all. In any case, shoots him. The guy runs towards the garage. He follows him into the garage, shoots him some more in the garage. I think five shots. Some more to the head. But, and he says the guy never took a ski mask off. Didn't take a ski mask off. Well, there were no holes in the ski mask. And the ski mask was found somewhere else. It wasn't beside the body. No. Interesting, huh? But there was no, I think maybe, there was no bullets in the hallway. No blood in the hallway. They show pictures. No blood. No bullets. But here is the, the bomb that got dropped. Because I had no idea. He had a girlfriend. Liz Labrador. <laughs> Sounds like a... I don't know. I don't know what her profession is. But <laughs> Liz Labrador. I don't look at the answer. Here comes Liz Labrador on the pole tonight. Anyway, I'm thinking Vegas. So, it, there's always a fly after me. What the hell? Okay. So, Liz was the other woman. And he's like, oh, everybody knows about Liz. Everybody, yeah, they, everybody, 
and they did. And we're going to hear testimony from other people. Yeah, we all knew about Liz. He mentioned her all the time. Did it bother your mother? Of course it bothered my mother, but he would mention it. I'm allowed to have girlfriends. There goes that fly. Yes. <laughs> and he said, you know, that he was back and forth about leaving Sharon. So we're going to hear testimony about that. So apparently we're going to hear from Liz Lavador, and she's going to testify that in February of 2008, she gave him an ultimatum. And she said, listen, it's her or me. So he had told Liz that he would find a way to end things with Sharon. Now, that's in February of 2008. This happens in May of 2008. Just a few months later, he figured it out, didn't he? That happens to be the same month, February of 2008, that he meets Mike Miller at in front of a convenience store. See, and he's got a 40 ounce beer in his hand. And so what does he do? He stops him and says, let me buy you a beer. Gives him another 40 ounce or buys the one that he's got. I don't know. He, he bought him the beer. Then he... um. He runs into him and says, oh, you, if you're going this way, I'll, come on, I'll give you a lift. So he, next thing you know, they're best buddies and he's coming over to watch TV and hanging out at their house. And he's play, paying them large amounts of cash to do work around the house. They're constantly talking about a roof that needs to be fixed that never gets fixed. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to hear all that, but I was just my, you had to pick up the jaw off the floor when I heard about Liz Labrador, like he was working on wife number seven. What? Are you kidding me? Anyway, she does not testify yesterday. So that'll be this next week. So also we're going to see phone records that between February when he meets Mike Miller and May 8th when the murder happens, there are hundreds of phone calls between Mike Miller and Thomas Randolph. We're also going to hear how Mike had been given a key to the house. And he knew when they were coming and going, they had just left for to go to Utah to visit his mother and father. Apparently his father was ill. So they had gone to Utah to visit his mother and father. They were coming home for the weekend going to celebrate Mother's Day, and then they were going to go back to Utah, which makes no sense, because he apparently he would always complain about the long drive because it hurt his back, so he's going to go all the way home with her and then come right back for Mother's Day. You could take her out for dinner in Utah for Mother's Day. I mean, anyway, in any case, the entire day of the murder was spent between Michael and Thomas Randolph. They were going to look at jet skis. He goes to the bank. He withdraws a large amount of cash because he keeps cash on him. I'm talking for me, a large amount of cash would be like a hundred bucks. Um, we're talking like twenty grand. He goes and takes out a large amount of cash. So these are the things that we're going to hear about this crime. That he, that, you know, at the end of all of this, you're going to find him guilty of double crossing Mike Miller. <laughs> so, conspiracy to commit the murder of Sharon Randolph with Mike Miller. And you're going to find him guilty of the murder of Sharon Miller and Sharon Randolph and the murder of Mike Miller. I'm like, wait a minute, that's it? What? Never mentioned any other wife. None. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. They're going to be waiting for, this is my theory, I think they're going to wait until Big Mouth, Thomas Randolph, takes the stand. Because he will. He did in the first trial. Two and a half hours, he was up on the stand. I think he's probably, because he, he just can't help himself. He thinks he's his own lawyer. I think he's on his third or fourth set of lawyers. In any case, <laughs> He's going to, he's going to screw up. About, his mouth's going to get him in trouble. It's going to open the door. And then their the other wives are going to come in, I think. We'll see. But let me know in the comments. 
if you did listen to the opening statements, was that enough? Is that enough evidence for the jury to convict him without the knowledge of all of the grooming he did with other people and prior wives and the policies and the, I don't know. I will tell you that, uh, I think I mentioned this in one prior episode. He is, he has a jury for the guilt phase of this trial. If the, and if they find him guilty, and now I'm wondering if they will, if they find him guilty, the jury will be dismissed at that point. Now, usually they get to stay and decide the penalty phase, life without possibility of parole or death penalty. But in this case, Thomas Randolph has signed away his right to a jury for the death penalty phase and said that he will allow the judge to decide his penalty. Interesting. Okay, so then the defense gets up and they do their opening statement and they talk about how this guy was stealing all their earthly possessions, all the, all the costume jewelry that you could find. Although later witnesses do confirm that within that costume jewelry, there were some valuable pieces of jewelry. Um, they described their client as being brash and cocky. Oh yeah, he is. But that's just him. He uses the F word when he's talking about whether he loves you or not. You know, that's, that's this guy. That's the way he talks. Okay. So you can't find guilty based on that. Then they talked about how not only in the garage did they find the ski mask, not near the body, but near the body they found jewelry, cash, large amount of cash. Remember now he knew that Thomas had withdrawn a large amount of cash, prescriptions, and guns. So but here's the question is, why would he go in now, knowing he had spent the entire day with Thomas Randolph? He knew that they had been gone the week before. Why didn't he do it then? He knew they were going to be gone. But that whole, he knew they were leaving again after the weekend. Why would he pick the hour that they went out for dinner to go in and rob them? That's the part that makes no sense. If you're taking away all the other wives, and you're, that's what you're left with. I'm still questioning why would somebody commit a burglary then? That makes no sense. Also, within the items that were found on Mike Miller was his wallet. And within that wallet, he had another person's driver's license and another person's EBT card, indicating that He's a burglar. I, I don't know what the significance of that was, why he had those. I guess we'll never know because he's dead. Um, I don't know. It didn't make, it made no sense to me what the relevance of those items were, but he had them. Now, I was asked by a subscriber yesterday, can the jury ask questions? Now, there's certain states in, the, in this country where, yes, the jury can ask questions if the judge allows it. Uh, one of the states I know of is Florida and the other is Nevada, that they do allow jury questions if the judge allows it. So after listening to the testimony yesterday, yes, she is allowing jury questions. However, they didn't ask any. <laughs> they had no questions. The first person to take the stand was Colleen Bayer, 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 B-E-Y-E-R. Colleen took the stand first, and then her husband, Michael, took the stand. Now, Colleen is the daughter of Sharon Randolph. Colleen testified that at the time of these murders, she was five and a half months pregnant with her third child. She had two little boys at home, one of whom is autistic. Uh, and this child she was pregnant with was a girl. Now, prior to her mom meeting Mike Randolph, she had been on the outs with her mom over the death of her stepfather, who her mother had been married to uh, for since 1975 for over 20 years, but he passed away in 2005. And there was some squabble over that. He, he, she was, Sharon was left a large amount of money from life insurance for the prior husband. And 
another large sum of money, approximately 80000 So 200000 from life insurance, another 80000 from his 401k. During which time, between 2005 and shortly after that, she meets Thomas Randolph, they managed to spend all the money. They bought a pool, put a pool into the house. She meets Thomas Randolph online. Nobody approves of Thomas Randolph because she met him online. Um, none of the witness are allowed, witnesses are allowed to talk about his prior wives, so that doesn't come out. You know, you know, they're asked, some of these witnesses are asked, you didn't like him, did you? No, I didn't. But they can't say why. They can't say because he was married six times. You know, several of his wives are dead. No, I don't like him. No, they're not allowed to say that. So he met the defendant. Thomas Randolph met Sharon in January of 2006. So shortly after her first husband of this, or her second, I don't know, God, <laughs> how many husbands? Who has all these husbands and wives? I just, I don't get it. I've been married one time in my whole life. And anyway, <laughs> I just don't get it. So Colleen's father was not the man she was married to since 1975 for the 20 something years. But this was the guy she thought of as her father. And she was a little bit upset with her mom some over her father's death. So, but they rekindle their relationship after she marries, she meets and marries Thomas Randolph. She did admit that her mother had a gambling problem and that she was burning through that money pretty quickly. So she was a little critical of her mom for that. She recalled having a conversation with her mother out by the pool one night. She said that we were out there because her mom wouldn't smoke in the house. She says, my mom wasn't a huge smoker, but when she was upset. She would smoke. So we were out by the pool. She was smoking. She was telling me that Randolph told her that things were not being married to her wasn't working out for him financially. So he wanted a divorce. So then she talks about how her mom and Thomas had gone to Utah and she thought it was strange too that he would, they had gone over there for a week. They were coming back for this Mother's Day and then they were leaving and going back. So Apparently, when they were on their way back from Utah, they called Colleen and Colleen's husband and said, hey, why don't we get together for dinner with the kids? And so they did. As soon as they got back into town, they took them out for dinner. This is the night before the murder. They go to the Santa Fe again. They take them out to the Santa Fe for dinner and everything's fine. Then the night, she says, you know, that particular day, Thomas had spent the entire day with Mike Miller. Then that night, Sharon and Thomas went out for dinner. She didn't find out that her mother was murdered until the following morning or the, when she got a phone call from a friend who said, I just saw on the news that there was a shooting and it's on your mom's street. And then she, that's how she figured out. She put on the news and she heard about her mother. Meanwhile, Thomas had called her husband, Michael, and to tell him that Sharon had been shot by Mike Miller, the handyman. This is something that Mike testified to. And that he was going to leave it up to Mike to let her know. Sharon had been trying to call her mom all that day, the next day, and wasn't getting an answer until she figured out, you know, uh, uh oh, mom was shot, and she's dead. Then she says a couple of days after the murder, this. Alice, who is a friend of, a very good friend of Sharon, her, Alice's husband comes by with an envelope and he says, uh, this is from your mom. And it was the will, a will that, and we haven't heard Alice testify, but it was a will that Alice had in her possession that superseded the will that was in the defendant's possession. And he was being really, really nice up until he discovered that that will existed. He was kept, he kept telling him, oh, I'm going to fix up the house. We're going to sell it. I'm going to be part of the proceeds for the kids. And he was being real, real nice. And then when he found out he was not the beneficiary of the will and wasn't going to get the house, 
Diddy was pretty angry about it. So we got to hear about all that testimony. Then Mike testified, the husband of Colleen. One of the things he testified to was he, this handyman thing was very, very weird. He had Easter dinner with them. And he said, like, it, Easter's a family dinner. And I think he was, I think the defense was trying to get him to say that, you know, because he was black, that he didn't trust him. But he wasn't going to go there. He just, he, he said, well, why were you uncomfortable with him? You know, is it something about his looks? What was it about him that you were uncomfortable with? He said, because it's a family dinner and he's not part of the family. <laughs> so he did say that. But he said he would get these large amount of cash, cash to do odd jobs, like help clean out the garage. He gave him $300, not to clean out the garage, to help clean out the garage. Yeah. And then he said they kept talking about this roof that needed to be repaired. And he said, never saw any progress on the roof, never saw any work being done on the roof. But they were always together, these guys. Um, and Mike testified, as well as his wife, Colleen, that this Liz Labrador's name came up a lot, that the defendant didn't see anything wrong with having a girlfriend while he was married to Sharon. And it did bother Sharon. It bothered Sharon a lot. Because he would keep leaving her. He kept leaving Sharon to go visit her. And he would do it at weird times, like Christmas. Oh, no, I've got, I'm packing up. I'm, going, I'm leaving you. I'm going to go stay with Liz for the holiday. Who does that? But then the defense had, well, he was there on Easter, pointed out, you know, yeah, but that's not Christmas. For me, Easter, you know, Easter is just an okay holiday. I mean, it's, you know, you have, you have ham and hunt for Easter eggs. And, but Christmas, you know, you want to be around your family. And he would leave to go stay with his girlfriend. I can't wait to hear this girlfriend testify. So then the final two witnesses for yesterday were friends of Sharon's. One that she worked with at an assisted living facility in Vegas. This woman testified that she had known Sharon for eight years because they worked together. She was the manicurist. Sharon was the hairdresser at this senior facility. And she told this woman that she had met him online, the defendant, and uh, that they, he, he, she was being pressured to marry him. And she's like, oh no, that's going to be a mistake. Don't do it. This, this, lady, this was the lady of doom and gloom. Don't do it. And, and then she said this several times on the stand, and I thought it was kind of funny. She said, Don't ever accept anything, food or drink from him. Don't it, don't do it, and don't turn your back. Who gives that kind of advice? With friends like that, you don't need enemies, right? Turns out she was right, but, you know. And she was gloating, gloating a little bit about that. Yep, I was right. Because Sharon came in one time. Well, Sharon in, eventually had to quit that job because she was getting really frustrated. She said after at first, Sharon was very giddy about this relationship. It was a new relationship, so she was really giddy. And, but then it turned into her being very frustrated and angry with him because he would call her 15 times a day at this, at her employment. He was just harassing her was the name, the, the adjective she used. He was harassing her and she would get really frustrated. So she had to quit. Then she runs into her one time and there she says she's really sore. And she goes, well, what's wrong? And she says, well, we were out on the boat. He made an abrupt turn on the boat and I was standing up and I lost my balance and I'm really sore from falling down. And she says, oh, he's trying to kill you. She was right. So then she talks about, she. I think this is just this woman that was just enjoying the heck out of being in the limelight. Look, I'm on YouTube, Court TV, you know. <laughs> she said, I had a, my cell phone in one hand and I had my remote in the other hand on the day of the murder. And I was getting ready to call her to see if she was okay. 
and instead I chose to turn the TV on first before I called her and when I turned the TV on there it was she was dead good story yeah that's how she learned about the murder then the next person the final person on the stand yesterday was a, name, a woman named Victoria another long time friend this one she'd known Sharon since 1975 she knew the prior husband she said we would go camping you know her and her husband and and Sharon and her other husband they'd go camping and everything and then they kind of lost touch and she said one day they were out shopping at Mervyn's and they run into Sharon and this guy she learns is Thomas Randolph and they were looking at wedding rings at Mervyn's and she said he was just out and out rude Sharon tried to introduce them and he wouldn't shake their hands. He just he looks at them and then looks back down at the rings and just kind of dismisses them, which she thought was really odd. And then one week before the murders, she was talking because she would go, Sharon was her hairdresser and she would actually go to Sharon's home to get her hair done. And so she was in the home all the time. She saw Mike Miller. She saw Thomas Randolph. So a week before the murders, right before they left for Utah, Sharon tells her that she's very unhappy and that she wants to divorce Thomas Randolph. So she's, she's, well, why don't you? Well, because I don't have any place to stay and, you know, I want to stay in my home. This is my home. And um, she says, no, you can come stay with me and my husband. You know, it's not a problem. So she says, okay, I'll talk to you about it when I get back. So she leaves on that week for Utah. They get back into town. She's murdered. Never gets to talk about divorcing her. Thomas Randolph with her friend again. That's where we are in the testimony. Not a peep about an ex-wife. Not one single peep. I know. Are you still with me? <laughs> okay. I know. It's it's an I find it an interesting story because you know, I'm of that age where, you know, the, first of all, I'm done with computers. I would not meet anybody on a computer, but I mean, I went through that age in my fifties where I was looking on match.com and there's these guys that just prey on women that are that age, you know, and they're, they, they take advantage of their loneliness and the fact that they've got a little bit of money and they see dollar signs, I guess. I don't know. I would not be picked to be on this jury. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Get her out of here. Get her out of here. Okay, guys. That is the show for Saturday. I hope you enjoyed it. Tomorrow I'm going to be live at 11. We're celebrating the event. The Great Escape 2023 is a diamond painting event. But please come to the live. We chit chat about law and crime and we... Whatever whatever you want to chit chat about whatever you're working on what are you crafting while you've been listening to me all week that's kind of like where we end up talking about all right guys have a wonderful weekend don't work too hard don't get caught in any thunderstorms and i will see you on monday in crafting and crime daily bye